you can tell when someone's in their body and they turn towards you and smile like it's wow there they are if we grow up in an environment where that's not happening there is a kind of emptiness that develops in us and we don't expect it hence people feel like they're alone in the world Welcome to Love Link, your guide to love and connection in all forms. We're your hosts, Simone Humphrey and Sina Simon. Our guest today is psychologist Michael Clemens, a Gestalt therapy expert and a lead faculty member at the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland and Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California. He is the author of Getting Beyond Sobriety, Embodied Relational Gestalt, Theory and Applications, and has written extensively about Gestalt therapy, addiction, and the body. This interview was recorded in the early fall of 2020, so you'll hear references to life during COVID before vaccines and the Black Lives Matter protests. Welcome to Lovelink, Michael. So happy to have you on. Yeah, my pleasure. So just to start us off, wondering how, how you're doing, how you've been holding up during COVID. Mm, it's a great question. Um, given what we're going to talk about, embodiment and being in my body and all of us, I've been doing well, and yet the normal physical contacts that are so much a part of the exchange of our lives, has I'm, I'm separated from that because I live by myself. Mm. And so I'm going through these odd experiences of connecting by elbow bumps or nods, um, and uh, sometimes I experience what other people do is like a skin hunger. Mm. You know, the experience of wanting to hug someone or, you know, or just feeling hands shaking. Yeah. You know, just that whole sense of uh, knowing through tissue is, is uh, really diminished right now. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It leaves us feeling really isolated. And I think a lot of us lonely. I've re- mm. I realized how much I miss even if it's not actual dialogue, just being like having the body heat in a room full of people exactly. feels so big. I, I'm like yearning mm. for it so much. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, some days are beautiful. It's almost 80 degrees here in Pittsburgh today and sunny. I have all the windows open. What has happened is the return of nature. Mm, yes. When we were quarantined and people weren't really active, there were so many, there were thousands of birds in my yard. Right. And uh, all these chipmunks and raccoons were wandering around. It reminds me of out in Big Sur when there's been severe fires and they've closed the highway out in, in rural areas, how nature finds a way and comes back. So when we started traveling more, I felt a little disappointed. I was missing all the birds. It seemed like they left. Mm, yeah, I yeah. think the cars scared them away. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we went on time out for a little while and nature emerged. Yes, we did. <laughs> yeah. So you identify as a Gestalt therapist. You recently mm-hmm. wrote a book on Gestalt therapy and its applications. So mm-hmm. tell, can you tell us a little bit about what Gestalt therapy is? Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the most common question we get and when I train students uh, we go through the down and dirty how to answer this um, I think very simply Gestalt is a therapeutic and awareness practice based on attending in the present moment to our experience that is what we feel in our body what we notice for example in our breathing in our gestures what we're aware of in, we might call the environment in other people. And particularly the word gestalt actually in German, gestalten means pattern, configuration. So we're interested in gestalt, I'm interested in the patterns of behavior, feeling and movement through which that we construct and understand our world. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, uh, it's more, there's more complicated theory or theoretical aspects to it. The most important part, other than what I'm saying 
is the notion of, we call it constructivist, that the way I experience the world is through who I am. Mm -hmm. um, what is secondly most important is the notion that I am always embedded in a field of relationships with the world and with other people. There is no isolated person, even though we might feel this. Even now as I'm talking, I'm hearing somebody uh, playing around with a painter's ladder next door and I hear a bird over there and I'm aware of this pillow behind me. Um, we are always embedded in a physical world and in a relational world. And uh, in Gestalt, we're interested in how, how do I enhance my relationship? What supports do I need to be more in relation in the physical world? And even more interestingly, which is not a kind of a solution oriented, is how do I interrupt my contact? How do I diminish my embodiment, my relationship? Because in my way of doing that, in my pattern or my gestalt, is also usually my history. That is what I learned to do as a child growing up, whether it's trauma, whether it was coming from a big family, um, we were chatting, if I can say, we were chatting about Scandinavia. And the first time I wrote this in one of my chapters, in a book, I, the chapter is called Body and Culture. And I was with uh, a student who, she was crying, this older woman was crying and didn't understand. And it turns out that her husband had committed suicide. And uh, she had been in a training program for five years and never told anyone. And uh, they all, and I said, well, where's the Kleenex? And they said, we don't use Kleenex. I said, what's up? And they said, well, we don't really cry that much. Um, uh, we rub it on our sleeves. So I went to the bathroom and I got the old fashioned European toilet paper, which is a little brutal. Uh, <laughs> and, and we ended up talking about how how culturally holding in tears was the part of way of being and uh was just a beautiful conversation of realizing it wasn't that people didn't care that they, they had learned culturally somehow to hold in that expression and it's in sort of an extreme example but it's true for all our cultures so in gestalt and 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 working somatically working with people's body i'm really interested in Especially now, we're talking more about what's called black body, white body, the, the, uh, yeah, what we learn in our body through racism, with the dominance around gender. That's all grist for the mill. And in Gestalt, we're interested in all that is part of the field, if that makes sense. Part of the, the way we are. Yeah. So if, if a patient, just to sort of unpack it a little bit, if a, if a patient comes to you, let's say a patient who's, you know, suffering from a lot of anxiety in this moment in time because of COVID, but maybe because of other things going on in their lives, how might you incorporate gestalt techniques to, to help them through that mm -hmm. anxiety? Mm -hmm. Well, first we pay attention to breathing. This anxiety is just highly related to how we, it doesn't cause our breathing, but it's part of the anxious process. So in Gestalt, what I pay attention to, and this comes from one of our founders, uh, there were three founders of Gestalt, Frederick Pearls, known as Fritz, uh, his wife, Laura Pearls, and then Paul Goodman, who was from New York. And, but Laura is the one I trained with, and she spoke a lot about the supports. What kind of supports do people need to experience the moment? Like, how can this person tolerate feeling themselves? And one of the ways is to go with, that I go with, is attending to breathing and maybe slowing down their breathing a little bit. Uh, sometimes people are anxious, can't get their breath, or, you know, there's an old kind of romantic uh, phrase, this is, it, you took my breath away, or something takes my breath away. Well, often that has to do with fear and anticipation as well as excitement but it's usually uh, anticipation so i would work with 
first attending to the support of breathing and getting my client to feel more in the room or in present with me and being curious about what they needed to do to do that, mm. which is challenging in the virtual environment. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, Simone was talking just about like, it, you know, feeling the heat of other people. But sitting in the room with someone breathing and seeing them as a live person in front of you can be very grounding. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's where I would go. And then just the last thing is I would want to eventually have the person begin to notice what about the field or the context they're in that maybe evokes this anxiety. Mm-hmm rather than treat their anxiety as a symptom to be diminished that has nothing to do with their life world. Uh, Mark Twain said the only way out is through, Mm -hmm. and that's gestalt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But let me just say this, go through while having adequate support both from yourself and from the relationship. Yeah. Because if I could go through, I would. So what do I need to do to be able to to go through and to be present? Mm -hmm. And I think so many patients come in, I mean, I know myself as well, where there's just this automatic reporting. And Mm -hmm. so they can talk and talk and talk about their lives and have Mm -hmm. no sense of what they're feeling. And it's kind of amazing. I mean, I love, it's so beautiful what you say, like just paying attention. Because I think so many people have no idea that they might be holding their breath or sucking in their stomach or being tense. It's just, it's happening so unconsciously for them. And mm-hmm. that when you do have them kind of turn in and notice, I found that a lot of times patients just break down. Absolutely. Like it sure. somehow unlocks all this emotion when you start to really pay attention to your body. What, why yeah, do you think the, that is? Well, I think uh, part of what happens is there's a difference between talking about, which is a, uh, uh, I can experience a slightly away from me or as my narrative, and I may say the same story over and over again. Um, there's a difference between that and what noticing myself as I'm speaking. So Goodman said, I never want a client to leave with less than what they came in with. I don't want to take away their talking. What I would like them to do is, is begin with, what are they aware of as they're talking? How do they experience themselves as they're talking? Uh, do they feel satisfied after they said that? What happens after they got that out? Did they notice a difference? And then, of course, people will say things like, I don't know what you mean, which is my opportunity to say, well, what I really mean is, did you feel softer? Did you feel tighter? Did you feel a sense of relief? Where did you feel that? Um, The question of how do you experience yourself and what are you aware of is is really the solution to our times. And it was when Gestalt got started. Most of us don't pay attention to ourselves, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And even politically, what everything that's going on that's so amazing, like that young African-American man was part of leading the protest here who brought the case of water bottles over to the police. I don't know if you saw that picture. Um, I was very moved watching that, and and uh, he was paying attention to what 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 was happening. They were fully dressed, and it was eighty five degrees, and they were hot, and you could see sweat rolling down his face. He was in the moment, and uh, a couple of them said no, but the one guy took the bottle and nodded at him, and that was as much profound communication as anything they would have said or done. It's like, it, uh, I, think, I think the challenge is helping people trust being versus doing or explaining. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And once you've had it, it's like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense? Yeah. 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 Um, and you use this term embodied. Mm-hmm. Can, you, can you, yeah, tell us a little bit about what you mean by embodied? Just to say that uh, I've been very influenced by the fact that the first 20-some years of my life I was an athlete. And so, um, and I grew up in a household with a father who had very severe MS. And 
So I was a, a very aware going up of physicality and differences in physicality. Um, my definition of embodiment is the experience of my, of the sensate experience of my body self. That is, they're not separate. Body self in relation to others and the world around me. So embodiment is experiencing myself as I am here. So as I'm talking to you, I'm aware of the kind of lilt in my voice or looking up and looking at the differences of the two of you. You're very different looking. Uh, uh, not only the color of your hair, the shape of your face, and I'm aware that what I'm doing, experience myself, is pulling back so I can see both of you at the same time. And now noticing my breath changing as I do that. Oh, I'm... Um, we spend a lot of time not noticing what's happening with us, either as we're down here attending to a task or out here and only focusing on the other. Embodiment is the experience of what we might call situatedness, being situated. If you get that word, we're always situated, but where are we situated? right here and now, in our body, in relation. Uh, sometimes we're not aware of that, and that's really kind of good. It's helpful not to feel some things. You know, if I watch the news after a while, I just feel kind of abused. Uh, and the dilemma comes when embodiment is, or disembodiment, which would be the opposite, and not feeling ourselves is a habit or pattern that we're not aware of. So gestalt is all about choice. Is I can choose in this moment that I just I don't want to do this. Uh, it doesn't feel I, it doesn't feel right to go into this giant store right now during COVID and my health issues. I'm deciding to turn away. That came from me noticing what was happening in me. A lot of what is in the world that we've done because the pace we live at and the complexity and and a lot of the trauma in the world is that we don't feel our bodies and we behave habitually without awareness. And so Gestalt is the process to bring us more into embodiment with the consideration of what might be difficult there. Mm -hmm. It's not all just flowers and kumbaya. If I spend my life not feeling myself, well, there is a raison d'etre for that. There is a reason for it. What are what are the costs of being disembodied? Like someone oh. who's yeah, someone who's not present, someone who numbs out, someone who's disconnected because it sounds great to be in the present and the here and now and I think a lot of us recognize that we're supposed to do that. But but why why is that helpful? It's really good that your generation has that that supposed to <laughs> it's better than, when i hear that a lot that's great at least it's there as a guilt right uh, right right um well a lot of things this you know this kind of work goes back at least in the western europe in the united states to uh a little bit with freud but a guy named wilhelm reich who invented something called body and character structure to the whole advance of the 60s and esalen and, and yoga and movement and gestalt um the, all of these approaches address a number of things. One is literally a monochromatic view of the world, kind of flatness. The cost can be things like um, flatness or a lack of sensation or emotion in relationships. Um, uh, a lot of physical problems seem related by not paying attention to yourself. Uh, you can get depressed, you can become uh, rigid, you can uh, not notice your basic needs uh, like food, the need for touch. Uh, people become shut down sexually or emotionally. Um, and um, the list is kind of legion. Um, when a child has a parent who is disembodied, while the parent may on some level love that child, they're not present to the child. 
you can tell when someone's in their body and they turn towards you and smile like it's wow there they are yeah. if we grow up in an environment where that's not happening there is a kind of emptiness that develops in us and we don't expect it hence people feel like they're alone in the world the individualistic paradigm that we operate off of, which is the white Western world, you know, Western Europe and the States, is really rooted in a lot of early isolation. And uh, that's why one of the things exciting about the protests and demonstrations has been the sense of the collective body, people feeling, oh, there are other people here, there's a we. So the primary disruption that happens uh, uh, is a, a, an erosion of the sense of relatedness of we. Mm -hmm. And what happens, we know that, for example, there was a lot of research. I'm talking about attachment now is really what I'm saying. Um, one of the things people do is they don't get it in their whole life and then they fall in love with somebody or it's or they get drunk with love with somebody, and then it's all about that other person, which is an, a lot of burden to take for, you know, 25, 30 years of loneliness. Um, but it, we sometimes give permission if that becomes eroticized or romantic, uh, then it's okay to do that. But very often, people can't even bring themselves in that way when they're so disembodied. People can be sexual, but not erotic. People can be romantic, but not present. Uh, uh, people can be very physical and then appear to be physical. And then you ask them what they're feeling and they don't know how to know. This is some of the costs of that. Yeah. Um, and it allows us to be disembodied is to, you know, if you've been in California driving down the highway, it's, or, you know, crazy places like, you know, large places like London or Rome and Europe, particularly this huge amount of traffic and so many people. I was in, in Seoul, Korea. It's almost overwhelming to be embodied, sensate in relation to all that. However, if we keep doing that and keeping doing that, we lose the capacity or awareness of our capacity to connect. I think it's also so important where you were talking about how when people are disembodied, sometimes their behaviors can become very habitual sort of and out of awareness so they don't have choice. There's like a lot more options, many more options when you know what's happening mm -hmm. inside mm -hmm. of you. Mm -hmm. uh, the early Gestalt work because the, Fritz Perls, Frederick Perls, trained and uh, in his uh, early training working with brain damaged World War One veterans, and what they got interested in is this notion of the two hemispheres of the brain, very simply, left and right side of the body. They noticed that people who were injured on one side of the brain, which would affect the other side of the body, over time would generate capacity to feel that side of the body again. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And so uh, early Gestalt got interested in what we call the left right split. It's like uh, if you ask yourself right now uh, this weird question are you right handed or left handed? Right. Right. What? Yes. <laughs> how do you know? How do you know? Because things are so automatic with my right hand. Right. Yeah, things are easier. Right. Yeah. Uh, Right. So now if you go switch over to your left hand and the left side of your body, what happens to you? What do you notice? Because you're also left-handed too. <laughs> <laughs> Feel the other side and what happens? An insecurity, like if everything's become more shaky. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. More of a disconnection. Like I, right. I don't feel as in touch with just my whole left side of my body. Mm -hmm. Like it feels more unfamiliar to me. Less you. Less me, yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting how that happens. And children often are forced early on, uh, unless they're raised in uh, 
cultures where like Brazil where they don't use their hands they use their feet all the time and because of soccer but children are forced used to be forced to define whether you're right-handed or left-handed what that does though is that relates to our neurology because the right side of our body is connected to the left side of our brain and so um, we can play around with what um, what happens this is what Fritz and Laura did a lot with is uh, you reach with your right, but what are you doing with your left? Mm -hmm. To begin to notice that. Um, that's one part of it. Uh, the other part of it is that we carry, uh, it's not only left and right, we carry up and down and front and back or different parts of our body that have either been traumatized or under-supported, like our heart, uh, or our genitals that have like there's been trauma literally frozen and pulled back that also don't feel like me. You know something that strikes me as really unique about Gestalt work, and I'm, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, is kind of playing with the body in the session, mm -hmm. kind of what you're describing now, but yeah. like tuning into a part of your body, maybe something that's that you've been disconnected with or that tenses or that. It, yeah, that you, situated in a certain way and then experimenting with other ways of being. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could yeah. speak a little bit to that. Yeah, I think um, what characterizes Gestalt is, is that we're experimental. And what we mean by that is kind of um, a couple ways. One is enactment, is that the... There's a book called The Dummy's Guide to Gestalt, and it's not bad. I like it. I, I kind of like it. But my version of The Dummy's Guide is how is what the client's talking about happening in the room right now? Or how can we bring it into the room right now? So I'll give you an example. Okay. I have a client who says, you know, my wife tells me, my wife tells me I hold back a lot from people. I have no idea what she's talking about. And, and for those who are listening, my back is pulled way back in the chair. <laughs> so an experiment might be, well, not to take it as metaphor, because, you know, that's a way in which we use metaphorical description of the body. Metaphors come from actual experience. So to actualize, to bring into the moment, I would ask the client to, can you feel your back right now? Where are, where is your back? And uh, this guy says to me, well, back where it should be, which is <laughs> kind of fascinating. Well, where's that? He said, way back in my chair, away from you. Mm. And he stopped and looked at me. He said, oh, oh, little tear in his eye. And we, we started to experiment with, could you move your back just a little bit forward and see what happens? And so he had to relax his legs to do that. And then he started to feel more. Mm -hmm. mm. So literally to bring the experimental enactment of the themes uh, into the room as a way to work with them. And it is not that I want people not to talk or to feel or think. It's really joining their bodily experience with the theme and feeling. That's really the art to Gestalt. And how much do you go back into history to get as much at, as necessary? Okay. Yeah, to get at <laughs> where some as, of this disembodiment comes from. Uh, always, yeah. it, in in some ways, uh, it just pops out sure. sometimes. Some people say that you know the story of my life is in my, I carry the story of my life in my mm. body. Of course, we do. We're like a tree that's been struck by lightning or had to grow around this shady place to get sun and so sometimes very little awareness uh, or very little sensation will bring up memory but I often ask people what does this remind you of I do a history in the beginning with people always a lot of these things are not immediately aware in what the person gives in their vita you know or their resume about themselves it's kind of slightly out of my awareness so it's sometimes discovered in the experiential process and um yeah i'll ask uh, what does this remind you uh when well we ended up the, to use the example of the man who was pulling back we ended up 
uh, exploring a little bit of it first just in the moment, somewhat in isolation. And then um, it began with me, like, oh, he, he said, yeah, and I'm back with you. There is a point at which you can feel that maybe the person, you know, obviously the person needed to do this with some. So I, I remember asking him, and I asked this a lot, is, where did you learn this? When did you learn this? Um, or even if of a sense of, if you close your eyes and go with this, who are you actually pulling back from? Mm. Which, boom. It's a great question. Know, and it was... Yeah. yeah, it takes me back to my, you know, tack, it takes me, and then there's my father. And so then we work it with his father, which, if remember when I was talking about, we work contextually in a field environment. So his behavior makes full sense in the relationship with his father. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I don't interpret, I don't say, well, this is that because uh, it's uh, really an attempt to be descriptive, to f- phenomenologically big fancy uh, European word but it means to just like experientially my meaning making where did I learn this mm-hmm. who did I learn this right. it's amazing how people can remember mm-hmm. or put it together yeah. and almost be back there yeah because I was going to say when you're embodied you can unlock that part if you're up in your mind you can kind of think about it you can maybe intellectualize it some patients can get there but that felt experience can have such a clarity to it. Oh, yeah, this is exactly how I was when I was a kid yeah. with my dad. Yeah. yeah. We believe insight comes from experience, not analyzing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's why experiments, that, that's why working in the here and now. I had this amazing experience. So I went to Esalen, which for uh. our listeners who might not know, it's a retreat center in Big Sur that is based in Gestalt therapy. And I, I was in my very first um, Gestalt group. And, you know, there's one person that goes into a hot seat or the empty chair. I'm not sure what it's called. And, and the rest of the group sort of watches as the Gestalt therapist does his work with um, the patient who's in the room. And the woman that, that kind of volunteered, she just started crying right from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And for the rest of the session... The therapist, she didn't say one word, by the way, in the entire hour and a half that we were there. Wow. He helped her to build this fortress of pillows. Somehow she was feeling really vulnerable, very raw, mm. open. She felt uncomfortable in the room, all these eyes gazing at her. He had her kind of build this fortress around her with all these pillows. She felt kind of safe and comforted and then slowly kind of peel back all these pillows and that was it. And she sort of talked about her experience, but there was not one piece of history. I had no idea what what content was happening, but something mm-hmm. transformative happened to her. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I remember, I mean, so, I forgot about that. And as you're describing it, I'm remembering it. I remember feeling so struck by this is therapeutic, but very little words were exchanged. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, she was already th- she was already there too. Yes, she was there. She was there. Yeah. How was that for you to hear? You said, wow, Sina. So you know. Oh, just the, 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 I'm just imagining the scene, mm-hmm. how powerful yeah. and how, uh, yeah. yeah, how, also, I was thinking how sweet it was that the therapist was helping her build these, the structure. And that it's very yeah. touching. <laughs> it's very moving. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's what I meant by supports. You know, the notion is supports for contact. What kind of supports to contact do people need? And uh, what she needed is some kind of boundary or wall to be able to build it and to feel that in order then to let down that. And they literally enacted her boundary need right in the room. Um, Yeah. What I would say, though, and this, this happens, is that in the office or, well, on the virtual now but many people don't come that sensate she was very there she was very in touch so the work could move towards experiment and action rather quickly uh because she had built the you know the uh pilot light was more than lit uh yeah and so yes that but that is exactly what we do that kind of is a beautiful piece of work who was that what was the facilitator's name do you remember 
I don't, but you know, I know he passed away like uh, oh. um, maybe five years ago, five a little bit more. He he huh. he had been there for a long time. He had a ponytail, yeah. long hair, I think red. Eric Erickson. Eric 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 Erickson. Yes, yes, Eric Erickson. Mm -hmm. That was That's him. That's a very very yes. good facilitator. Yes. Very very good facilitator. Yeah. Most people, like you're saying, don't come in in that state of sensing already. And I imagine that some clients are kind of like, what is it? what's going on? What are you asking me to do? I don't understand. So like, how do you kind of get, get people into the process of feeling themselves? Uh, That's a great question. Uh, I think that people need bridges mm -hmm. between how it is that they might think about the work and what we're doing. And the, uh, I, what isn't helpful to people is this black box approach that the client comes in and then you do some stuff and they don't have any context for it. So sometimes it's, it's very, well, I always try to give people a bridge about this is how I work. This is the intention of what I'm doing. So when that woman came to Esalen, she already knew what she was there for. And so she understood that. When people are, are coming for the first time, Sometimes I work with this young man who's a business entrepreneur and he had never been in therapy. And it was uh, it was an African American man and he was a white facilitator and it was during the protests and we were on virtually. It was a kind of a different context. We spent almost a whole session talking about how does this work? Um, and uh, we ended up but at the end of the first session, he said, cool, well, okay, uh, I'm willing to try it. We'll see how it works. And um, so sometimes people need a bridge to be able to support them. Uh, but also you, what I do with people is I'm going to ask you about yourself and what you notice about yourself. I tell them right away. And I'm also going to tell you what I notice or how I see you and what I hear and you're welcome to do the same with me. It's fair. It's both ways. Um, what do people say really, about you? They go, oh, um, <laughs> you're not what I thought you would look like. Um, I, I went through some health problems and I had a couple of people recently said, you look terrible. <laughs> and, and I said, well, thank you. Uh, but then I would say, describe what you mean by terrible. And can you tell me? Oh, there's a darkness under your eyes, and uh, and uh, and you know that's not always the focus, but but therapy needs to be understood in relationship to power dynamics. And so, if I'm going to invite you to um, us to that, I'm going to talk about the way your head head sl slightly tilts to your left when you listen. If I'm going to tell you about that, you know, uh, it's fair for you to, to say about me. And be aware that the reason that is, is the goal is of awareness about how we do ourselves. So a lot of people think that why is the most important piece. In Gestalt, it's not that why is not important. But in Gestalt, I'm more interested than in how and what than why how gets and what gets us to why. Um, sometimes I've explained to people, um, uh, very simply, I had a guy who, who was sexually abused as a child and he forgot it and he was driving around and in a car, he's in his 40s doing really well and he just wanted to ram other people with his car. And he was just really angry and beat up firewood and... Uh, you know, he came in, he said, can you make it go away? And I said, not right away, no. Uh, but maybe there's something to you wanting to hit something. Hmm. Maybe we could focus on you just wanting to hit something. What's happening that you're wanting to hit? And uh, so we talked about it and he said, I, I don't know why. These things seem innocuous to me. I said, well, maybe in you, you could notice this buildup of charge it looks like about and maybe it's connected to something else in your life that's a bridge right there would you be interested in exploring that and he said yeah i don't want to have a car accident 
So um, it wasn't long before he literally started to feel his anger with someone in his childhood. And uh, then I said to him, well, we're there now. Like, let's explore that. Can you, can you stay with that? And, and he said, I don't understand this. And I, I suggested a book on trauma and body. And uh, sometimes it helps people to read or read something, you know, really small or hear from me about other ways of working. Um, if, if you respect people in this way of working and the most important characteristic of a Gestalt therapist and of a therapist is curiosity about the client. Without that, we're technicians. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure.